And I would like to call this meeting to order. It's the regular meeting of the Committee of the Whole, 02-18, and today, Monday, February 12th. Um, I'd like to call upon uh, Joel Longfellow to sing our national anthem for us again. Would everyone please rise and face the flag. <clears throat> oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. Carlton Bras, se porte le peye, il se porte la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée, tes plus Thank you very much, Joel. We appreciate you leading us once again. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Again, it's my pleasure. Madam Clerk, are there any addendum items this evening? Mr. Mayor, there's an addition of a delegation of Mr. Brandon Anger regarding Planning and Development Planning Division Report Number 2018-14, Subject Recommendation Report, Proposed New Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw. And do we need the a motion to allow uh, Mr. Anger to present tonight because he... He's been added to the agenda. He's been added, okay. At the, well, I'd entertain a motion to confirm the agenda. Moved by Mrs. Kenny, seconded by Mr. Main. All those in favor? Opposed? Confirmed. Are there any disclosures of interest this evening? There being none, that shall be so indicated. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Amber LaPointe. Amber, could you stand up for a minute, please? We'll do that perhaps a little more formally in a couple of weeks' time, but Amber is our new uh, CEO, Manager of Legislative Services, and our new clerk. I've given you your job, yeah, Scott. Sure. <laughs> so, welcome and uh, thank you for coming. And She's not on the payroll until uh, next week, but uh, we're happy she's here to see how things go and look for constructive criticisms after the fact, too. Thank you. And entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the regular meeting of Committee of the Whole 01-18 held on January 22nd, 2018. Moved by Mrs. Kenny, seconded by Mr. Main. Any discussion? Being none, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Move on to determin determination of items requiring separate discussion. Madam Murray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Items 8 and item 12, please. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, item one. Thank you. Mrs. Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to speak to number one, and could I also lift number 19? And I think that'll, I think that'll do it. That's it? I think so. Thank you. Mr. Bonner. Put me down to speak to number one, two, please, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Anyone else, Mr. Bonner? No. Nope. Mr. Doucette? None? Mr. Elliott? No. Very good. Okay, 
just one more time, one more time if there's any disclosures of interest. I don't think we got that. Uh, the disclosures of interest. Uh, are there any disclosures of interest? There being none, it shall be so indicated. I thought we'd already done that, so it's okay. Okay, well, perhaps we can approve those items that don't require a separate discussion this evening. Can I have a file or a motion, Mr. Bonder? So moved, seconded by Mrs. Kenny. Any discussion? Being none, all those in favor? Carried. We have a presentation this, this evening from Terry C. He's a volunteer with the, one of the board of directors for the YMCA and Sharon Shills, who's the center manager of Fort Coburn YMCA, representing, presenting the Fort Coburn YMCA's five-year operation report. <coughs> Terry, can you come forward and press the little red button there? And ordinarily, we have 10 minutes for our presentation. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Maloney, council members, city of Port Coburn staff, and members of the public. As you know, my name is Terry Cease. For those who know me, I'm a volunteer at the YMCA of Niagara, and I'm the board chair. Um, I'm pleased to be here tonight to present the Port Coburn YMCA five-year uh, five-year report to the council and, and community. And with me, Sharon Schultz, center manager of the Port Coburn YMCA. Uh, we'd be pleased to answer any questions as we go through the report tonight. Um, okay. As you can see from the stats on the first slide, the past five years, the YMCA has been able to achieve some significant milestones in Port Coburn. This has inclu included employing over 75 staff and engaging 99 volunteers annually and em engaging children and youth in over 2,000 camp days in the city of Port Coburn. Positive impact the YMCA of Port, it, the positive impact the Port Coburn YMCA is having in our community can also be captured through feedback received from participants. These are just a few of the many com comments that the YMCA staff and volunteers have received from members of Port Coburn facility. The next slides will take us through our strengthening communities roadmap and illustrate where we come from and what we have been able to accomplish together. We went from the opening of the Valet Health and Wellness Center and quickly grew to over 2,000 members. The response from the community was overwhelming. Child and youth represented 50% of YMCA membership volu and volunteers increased and many community partnerships were formed. The five-year operation highlights. In year three and four, the YMCA introduced new programs, expanded our involvement in city and port City of Port Coburn events, as well as continuing to host our own events. This past year, the YMCA had 484 children participating in swim lessons on a weekly basis, continued to launch new programs based on member feedback, and continued to expand our partnerships. I'm very proud of the impact the long-term partnership between the City of Port Coburn and the YMCA has had on strengthening our community um, over the past five years. As the time frame of our report tonight runs from September 2016 to August 2017, the year, year end of the YMCA, it marks year five of the operating and we're embracing the opportunity to provide a report that highlights the serv service to the community, the impact the YMCA is having on Port Coburn residents and the financial and service performance over the past five years. The YMCA continues to have a significant and positive impact on Port Coburn community. During year five, the YMCA served 3,844 individuals at various point in times during the year, which represents approximately 20% of our population here in Port Coburn. So a pretty good impact in, in Port Coburn. The YMCA continues to be inclusive and open to all. Over our past five years, the Port Coburn YMCA has provided over $330,700 in membership assistance to children, families, and individuals whose circumstances would otherwise limit them from participating in the YMCA in Port Coburn. The YMCA continues to expand programs 
and services based on community feedback and interest. Since year one, we've added 33 new programs over the past five years in Port Colbert. In Port Colbert, the YMCA continues, the YMCA is actively working with 24 community agencies and groups to positively impact the lives of the community members in Port Colbert. The YMCA continues to provide leadership in a number of community events while being actively involved in many of city of Port Colbert events. Since day one, the YMCA received a very positive response from the community and within the first 13 months of operation, reached members on peak roll of 2,844. As with many new centres, as membership stabilizes, there is a fluctuation in the members on roll in the following two years and then an upward growth in year five, peaking at 2,690 members. As described in the report, the first five years of the Port Coburn YMCA operations laid the foundation for many years to come. Captured at the bottom of the budget, our YMCA key service ratios. The YMCA is happy to report that productivity and return on revenue have remained stable since year two. During years three and four, the operating service fund was reduced by close to $20,000 based on strong financial results the years prior. The YMCA continues to demonstrate strong fiscal responsibility <coughs> despite increasing costs and program expansion. As we move past the five years of operations, the YMCA recognizes the need for continued involvement in programs, services and events and help to strengthen the Port Coburn community. The YMCA will continue to maintain strong partnerships with the City of Port Coburn and other community organizations. The YMCA will participate in planning and collaboration with the City of Port Coburn around the future operational and capital investments required to maintain a safe, relevant facility and ensure high quality experiences for many years to come. The YMCA continues to be grateful for the strong partnership with the City of Port Coburn that enables us to collectively strengthen community health and wellness. Thank you everyone for your time and attention. Um, we welcome any comments or questions that you may have at this time. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we have to wait for a few minutes. We'll see if there are any questions from members of council. Any questions to my right? There'd be none. To my left, are there any questions? Mr. Monner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Maybe just a comment. <clears throat> I think it's evident, but I, um, I think we're ec ecstatic the way this has worked out, uh, you know, with the partnership between the city and, and the YMCA. Um, we never could have got this far this fast. You know, we'd still be looking at programming and everything. So thank you for your uh, expertise, which is what we really needed. And, you know, hopefully um, <clears throat> one thing I'll ask is that you talked about needs in the future, and uh, I would assume you're bringing requests forward to the city for any financial stuff because we're into budget and, you know, I, I figured that was happening, but I just had to ask the question. <laughs> so, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there a response to that last part of the question? Uh, absolutely. So we are scheduled to present to council in March with the budget for the next upcoming budget period. Okay. As uh, Councillor Bodner said, we're going into a budget deliberation, so I think we would like to have that information in advance of that, if you're ready. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other questions from anybody? There being none, Alder McKinney, are you sure? I'm happy with it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Next, uh, we have a delegation. <coughs> we have two delegations tonight. Um, you have a maximum of 10 minutes. Dr. Solanke, can you come forward on your, uh, your presentation on Heart Day? Yes, please. Good evening, Your, your Worship and members of Port Coburn Council. And thank you for allowing our delegation to uh, be present tonight. Uh, for the past few decades, uh, our practice, we've been a proud 
Chiropractic Associates of Port Coburn has been a proud member of uh, an inter international organization, Doctors with a Heart. And we've, over the past uh, numbers of years, been uh, uh, taking Valentine's Day and taking this as a special day to dedicate uh, a very charitable effort towards our community. Uh, and I'd like to just uh, relay a little bit of the historical perspective. Doctors with a Heart is an organization formed by a dentist back around 1986. Uh, it welcomes professions, uh, chiropractors, medical doctors, dentists from a cross-section of a variety of professions. And it's one day out of the year where our practice, we uh, come in, our doctors uh, work for free, we donate, we choose a charity. Uh, over the years, we've had the good fortune of supporting various charities in the uh, area, Food Bank, uh, Women's Place in Welland. And, uh, this year, we're once again going to uh, support the SPCA, Port Coburn Welland SPCA. Uh, it's a, an organization that uh, if many of you have been following the media, I think uh, last week there were 146 cats uh, rescued from a, a home in Welland and it, was, it brought the SPCA to a point where they had to close their doors. So it's a very worthy organization. Our patients and community get really very, very enthusiastic about this. They get behind the effort. But all of our doctors on that day, we come in, we donate our services. Uh, this provides a very, very useful um, way for some of the people that are less fortunate in the community to access some of the services that we provide in our practice. But it also allows us to, uh, in exchange, uh, we ask for donations to our adopted charity. And this, this year, again, it's the SPCA. So it's a, a really nice feeling. It's, it's very, very interesting. I, I, encounter people in the community who aren't even part of our our uh, practice who just come in and, and uh, offer donations to our charity but I'm proud to say uh, every year on this special day uh, we do uh, very very well we are successful in raising thousands of donations both monetary and uh, uh, supplies of various types uh, in this particular instance the SPCA has a list of uh, uh, items that they're specifically looking for that are listed on our, our press release. But tonight I invite you to support the Port Corbett and Welland District Humane Society. Um, if you know of anyone who uh, is in need of particular services that we offer, it's a day that we uh, uh, do take appointments because it's a first come first serve basis, but it's a very, very nice way that uh, we can uh, provide services to those in the community that are in need and also uh, help a, a notable charity. And, uh, I'd certainly be willing to answer any questions or uh, address any comments. Thank you, Dr. Solanke. Uh, any questions on members of council? On my right? Being none on my left. That's a good sign. Thank oh, you very thank much. You. <laughs> thank you all. <coughs> this time is our next delegation is Mr. Brandon Anger for his father, Grant Anger, dealing with the zoning bylaw. I come forward, Mr. Anger. And is that red light is still on. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, thanks for adding me to the agenda last, last minute. It's much appreciated. Um, I think some of you, or most all of you, have a letter that was circulated. But so I'll just do a quick uh, synopsis of it for everyone that um, the property is 679 Elm Street. It's been severed into three, three lots. Uh, we've purchased the lots immediately to the north and south of that property. Um, after calling uh, to the city hall, we found out that that's in, in the proposal here to be changed from an R2 zoning to an R4 zoning. Uh, the R4 zoning would not allow uh, the two properties that we bought to be usable in any way and the one in the middle would be also uh, not able to do anything in the future if they wanted to do any building of sorts as the frontage requirements would not allow it uh, allow it to do so. So really this, the request is that uh, the current R2 zoning remain on those uh, block of property. Um, and so basically left off the new comprehensive bylaw. And that's, that's really it. So there's. Any questions on, on that or anything? Is there any questions of members of council? Mrs. Kenny? Uh, just uh, one question uh, to you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Aquilina. I talked to with Mr. Aquilina today, so I don't know if this is the time or when I pull the report, because I pulled the report, yeah. should I 
ask the question now because I, I agree why, with Why don't you ask the question now while Mr. Angus Yes, here. I agree that this, uh, this parcel of property, 679 Elm, should be uh, remain R2 or Chase now on the R4 on schedule um, A in your package of our report and I'd like it to remain um, an R2 designation. That's fine. That's, that's what I'm asking. <coughs> and I hope I have council support for that. Any other questions, Councillor Bodner, and then Councillor Elliott? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Aquilina. Um, Dan, this is just something that got caught up in the, uh, like today it was one thing, tomorrow it was the next, so. From your point of view, it's not a big deal. Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Bonner, what this is in relation to, when the zoning map was first drafted, this predated Mr. Anger's or the applicant's property. So at the time, because of the one lot, it was one large lot, and that there was an existing house in the middle. So if the property was ever to be redeveloped, my intention was to have more intensification on the property and go to the R4 zoning. Since the draft mapping was created, there was a planning application to create a property on each side of the existing home. So as far as I'm concerned, going to the R2, that's supportable. Thank you. <coughs> Any further questions, Mr. Bonner? No, sir. Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Three to Dan. Dan, um, if we adopt this amendment, does this have to, the, can we still adopt the zoning bylaw or does it have to get circulated again or we can be finished with it today? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Elliott. If Council would support the change prior to the actual passing of the bylaw, I would just <coughs> like to note that that change be made so the bylaw can be continually approved I will then make the change to the actual schedule before that gets circulated with the bylaw number. So we can move forward. We can move forward tonight. Provided the bylaw is passed right. with the amendment being made to it. Doesn't need to be circulated for a change like that, does not need to have notification. And that's item one on the consideration of items. Correct, Mr. Mayor. Item number one. Any other questions? Councilor Kenny? Just, just so I'm clear. So I make that motion then when we're talking, when we bring number one up. Is that yes. okay? Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Anger, thank you okay. for appearing. Thank you. Next is my mayor's report. I have a number of items here. First and foremost is the fire at Vinyl Works Canada. Uh, that was six days ago. I would like to express my appreciation to our fire department personnel, Chief Cartwright, for their exceptional response to the large industrial fire on Tuesday morning at the Vinyl Works Canada plant. Appreciation is also extended to the many neighboring partners who came together to help fight the fire provide support to the firefighters and ensure our city remain protected. And that is one of the, uh, our many neighboring partners that's in the fire services of uh, Wingfleet, Wellen, Pelham, Fort Deary, Thorold, Niagara Falls. Did I get them all? <coughs> Again, our commitment to come together to aid communities in need demonstrates our collective strength on a lighter note, Sports Fest was last weekend, brought roughly 2,500 people out of their homes from this cold, dreary winter and from across the region to participate in Sports Fest. And that included uh, snow pitch, snow golf, volleyball, ball hockey, music trivia, soup cook off, and there was also, I saw, a uh, bocce game in progress outside the arena. The Mayor's Cup Invitational Hockey Tournament saw 16 teams play in four divisions, and congratulations going to the following division winners. Division A is Port Frontenac, Division B was Wainfleet, Division C was Lincoln, and Division D was Haldeman. Thank you to the YMCA of Niagara 
for opening their doors and providing free swimming and activities to, in the gym and to the many businesses who supported these events, raising money for great charities. The Parks and Recreation Ontario Award, the City of Port Coburn has won this award uh, under access of <coughs> and equity for municipalities under 30,000 for its Learn to Sledge program. This program started at the Valet Health and Wellness Center three year years ago and uh, as a result of a grant received from the province of Ontario. Interest in sledge hockey continues to grow in Port Coburn and around the world, evidenced by the great turnout this past Saturday for the Team Port Coburn versus the Team USA exhibition game here in Port Coburn in preparation for their trip to the Paralympic Games in Pyeongchang in Korea. Over 1,200 people but packed the failed health and wellness center to watch the game with Team Canada coming away the winner. And I was in the, the facility but was told that there wasn't a, a parking space to be had uh, in, the, uh, in the parking area. Canada 150 time capsule, uh, Port Coburn's sesquicentennial time capsule will be sealed up for the next 50 years at the Valet Health and Wellness Center this Saturday afternoon at 1 p.m. in the main lobby. All the items themselves will be securely and carefully packed into the time capsule. A list of what we are including will be revealed. The entire community is invited to attend this momentous occasion in our community's history. This time capsule will be set to open in 2067 during Canada's bicentennial, 50 short years from now. The Canada 150 Awards uh, also on Saturday, MP Badaway will be at the Valley Health and Wellness Center starting at 11 a.m. to present approximately 70 Canada 150 Awards to residents and organizations of this Friday who made a commitment who made a significant contribution to the celebration of Canada 150. And that is the extent of my report. Mr. Barrick, do you have a reasonable counsel? Mr. Mayor, for? Mr. Mayor, can yes. I just, I have just one question. Sure. N not so much about uh, your report, Mr. Mayor, but about um, your meeting with the region last uh, Thursday. On our meeting in December, your Worship, we had a meeting and it was voted unanimously, yourself included, that the region should not be involved in the lower tier municipalities business. You voted, and I have a record of your vote, that you voted after we all voted, no, you went to the region, basically, I would say behind our backs, and voted opposite to which you voted right in this chamber. And I want to know why you did that. Well, I'll be quite frank with you. Well, oh, good. Uh, I like frankness. Kenny, that, there was no vote. Oh, yes. There was a course. vote to refer that matter. It was now dealt with. It was dealt with Thursday. That was dealt with Thursday, Thursday night, according to this. No, there was, it was not. There was a, Mr. Berg is here as well. That matter was referred and has not been dealt with. That's not what this says. Well. From the region. Okay, we. Was forwarded to me by somebody from there. And it showed your vote. I also asked before that vote was called that this manor was still there and was not going to be dealt with. Well, it's good. Could you circulate that? I can circulate that, sure. Just got it, so I just uh, give me a second now. But thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yes, because I, 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 I was very disappointed. As a councillor, I was very disappointed because we had voted unanimously not to get involved in that. So I'm just going to see if I can find it here. There was also a motion that uh, preceded that incident uh, from Councillor Beatty from the town of Pelham. Yeah, Councillor Beatty sent it, and, I uh, believe. Uh, I'll be happy to circulate that one. That one I did support, and <laughs> I will circulate. That's the, the one I'm talking about. No, that's not. That's not the. Uh, Vote result. Issue. Can I send this to everybody? Is that um, possible for me to? Uh, well, what we can do. I appreciate you'd be upset if I voted against your wishes, but I did not vote against your wishes. I voted on Mr. Bay's motion. If you look at those recitals, uh, they're rather significant, and uh, in fact, this should end the controversy between the region and the uh, town of Helm, and uh, as it will, should be discussed and decided upon by the Ontario Municipal Board. 
so that there isn't the conflict between municipalities and the region. Well, I have it here. Perhaps, for some Mr. Reason Barrett, I... you can uh, uh, either support me or say I'm uh, out to lunch, uh, but do what you wish. Well, he was there, so in the room. I'm going by what was sent to me on an email. From whom? A regional Mr. official? There. there. Just, go ahead just, and hit send. Just wait one second. Uh, if, I know. I'm happy to provide my regional report, Mr. Mayor, and then perhaps I can assist in answering additional questions with respect to well, we, ongoings at the region. We can, you can do your regional report, and then we'll deal with this later, I guess. Thanks. And uh, I wish you would have discussed this beforehand. We could have uh, avoided all this uh, well, uh, inaccuracy and controversy. But we'll go ahead now with Mr. Barrick's report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to first take the opportunity to thank the uh, city committee, the, and, and, and correct me if I don't get the uh, name of it correct, the committee on uh, social, uh, social uh, determinants affecting health committee. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay. Close enough. Close enough. So I got an invitation to join that committee to provide some information with respect to regional involvement on housing and homelessness in initiatives, et cetera. Um, so I appreciate the invite. I was unable to make it, but I do want to thank publicly Commissioner Adrian Jugley, who was able to attend on my behalf, and I greatly appreciate that. Uh, and I understand she did provide some information uh, to that committee, which I hope was helpful. Um, I would ask uh, certainly to, to that committee, I'm happy to make the next one. I think it's in May. So please keep me posted, and, and I'm happy to join uh, the future committee on the good work that that committee is doing. Um, might be appropriate, uh, given the discussion around housing, uh, to highlight to this council and to the public exactly what the region is doing with respect to housing. Uh, so in Port Colborne, the total number of NRH affordable housing units, there's 88 NRH owned units and 139 nonprofit or co-op units. There are 41 uh, rent supplements in Port Colborne currently, including housing allowances, portable rent supplements, etc. Two uh, individuals using first subsidies, housing first subsidies with supports. There is a family using the NRH home ownership program in Port Colborne, and there are nine applicants accessing Niagara Renovates program totaling $160,000 in 2017. Um, we all know that that is not enough. There are over 500, about 560 people on the NRH affordable housing wait list uh, just in Port Colborne. And so uh, what the region is doing, I've named, but clearly it's not enough. And you can extrapolate that across the entire region uh, but what I can say is that we continue to work towards uh, meeting the demands through a variety of uh, venues. Uh, one of them, and I believe it was announced at the committee level as well, that the region is um, just finalizing and waiting on provincial approval for eight new units in Port Colborne, so new construction, eight new units with supports to be provided through the home for good capital build in 2018 would be on King Street here in Port Colborne. The region recently as well, at its last meeting actually, approved the Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative Investment Plan, which is just under $10 million uh, for the year. That particular round of funding is provided from the Niagara region, working collaboratively with 22 agencies in the region to deliver homelessness services to residents of Niagara. In particular, items like emergency shelter solutions, housing with related supports, other services and supports, homelessness prevention, and as well, program administration. Mr. Mayor, the other item that was discussed as well at the last regional council meeting with respect to housing uh, will hit this council chamber's desk as well as every other local municipality in the region. 
and that is um, the discussion around exempting NRH owned units from paying property taxes. Currently, the NRH, Niagara Regional Housing, pays $4.8 million every year on property taxes. And so the thought is, if they don't have to pay the property taxes, they could use that $4.8 billion directly into additional housing units, additional rent subsidies, et cetera. Of the $4.8 million that goes towards property taxes, 2.2 .2 of that goes to local area municipalities. In Port Colburn, NRH spends $140,000 a year of the 140, $70,000 goes to the city of Port Colburn. And so what was approved to be circulated was in fact to check with our municipal partners uh, as it relates to the impacts on them on a variety of scenarios and options which would possibly see the waiving or reduction of NRH property taxes being paid so that they can be diverted into frontline uh, service delivery. I would also note that it should be clear that the alternative service delivery report on social housing is anticipated to come to council, regional council this spring. It will contain options and recommendations that could potentially impact how NRH owns properties, as well as other suggestions on the use of incremental property revenue to, to fund social housing programs. So there's more to come. We look forward to the, to the uh, feedback from this council and um, every other council uh, in Niagara. Just a further item on, as it relates to homes and housing, I did want to highlight and congratulate the region's long-term care homes and the service providers for receiving accreditation with commendation recently by Canada's Health Care Accreditation Body, Accreditation Canada, recently completed a comprehensive independent evaluation of Niagara Region's eight long-term care homes, issuing a final successful standing of accredited with commendation. Niagara Region's long-term care homes successfully met 98.1% of accreditation program requirements, which is valid until 2021. What does that mean? Well, there's 100 standards and 457 areas of focus. The survey team report stated that senior services has gone beyond the requirements of the accreditation program and is commended for its commitment to quality improvement. On Thursday night as well, uh, regional council did petition the province for additional funding for senior services, in particular long-term care homes in the Niagara region. Senior services had continued to focus on achieving savings through continuous quality assurance efforts, but savings realized over the past few years have been used to offset inflationary pressures. Senior services face the challenge of sustaining the current level of care with an increasingly compromised resident population. The challenge is further exacerbated when striving not only to sustain, but in fact increase the staffing levels to ensure continued quality care, safety, and expected service levels. So the particular request and again, long-term care homes, there is significant provincial funding in that area. The request is for four hours of direct care per resident per day. That's my report, Mr. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions of Mr. Barrick? Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Barrick. First of all, I want to uh, Thank you for sending, sending Adrian down to us. Uh, I co-chair the, uh, co the uh, Social Determinants of Health Committee, and uh, as a result of, of uh, her taking part in our last meeting, we were able to put forward the true need of Port Colburn and, and the housing crisis that we face. And for, we were actually able to get some great dialogue going and have a far better understanding of where the region's at and why it can't seem to address our needs. So that was very important to, to be able to have that conversation. Um, so that was helpful, and I want to thank you for that. Um, I do have a question, though, that uh, concerns me terribly. Um, as you know, I, I'm heavily involved with the East Village Task Force and, and with a lot of the um, social issues that are, are, uh, Port Colburn is facing today. And I pick up the newspaper and see, wow, $7.4 million shortfall, or deficit, rather, with the police board. And I'm really concerned. I know that means cutting, and I know that uh, the last thing that we need to see here in Port Colburn is less services. So I just want to have some idea from you as to, um, first of all, 
how that's going to be addressed, if there's any answer at all to, have, to, to be had on that one. Uh, will there be cuts? Will it be in frontline services? How's that going, how's that going to come down? That's uh, one question that I would like answered. And then there are more, but if you'd want to do that one first, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor. I appreciate that. Um, and again, please keep me posted on the work in the committee that you're doing uh, for the city as well. I appreciate that dialogue ongoing for homelessness and housing. With respect to the police, so um, you know here, municipalities, you can't uh, deficit finance. And so when you hear a $7 million deficit, it's not, it's not actually truly reflective of the reality that police board can't end the year with a deficit. The audited statements, they never show a deficit. Same with the city statements, the region statements. So um, the audited statements will be balanced. Uh, with that said, there uh, is a, a funding shortfall of about two, between two and $2.4 million of with which uh, will go back to the region to who was ultimately responsible uh, for paying that cost. Will services be reduced? No, in fact, the opposite. Um, service levels, I was here uh, about three weeks ago, the last city council meeting, and I highlighted really the bottom line this term for, for the police services board. Um, the 2003 term of the police board, their budget went up over 30%. The next term went up over 18%. The next term over 15%. This term, is less than 10% increase. For the first time since 1980, we have added 16 new officers, which means to the front line, for the first time, the percentage of sworn officers that are actually frontline officers is going up. It's been a downward trend since 1980. Frontline officers are going up. Not to mention, as you may recall, uh, the motion that I put forward at the beginning of this term that secured the Port Colborne detachment as well. With respect to the arbitration issue, um, a lot of what you're seeing around the deficit, uh, number one, as you know, city council sets a budget, it's up to staff to meet that budget. Uh, same with the police services board and regional council. But part of it was monies through an arbitrated process set aside into a reserve until after the arbitration award. And Sarah, so part of the seven million that you referenced is being funded through the use of reserves. But that money was purposely put into the reserve to offset uh, uh, what has occurred. Previously, there was three to 4% uh, arbitration award year after year. This round, there, it's less than 2%. And so it's fully funded. That's why there was a 4.5% budget increase for 2018 for the Police Services Board. Um, for 2018. However, the term as a whole is less than 10%. But to answer your question, uh, Councillor, uh, no, services are not being reduced. Uh, quite contrary, we're putting more money to the front line. We're putting the police services on the path of sustainability. I hope that helps answer that one. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Man memory, next. Yeah, I just have the one, the one more question uh, for Councillor Barrick. Now, I, I mean, we see that we're still left to cover 2.4, roughly 2.4 million dollars has to still be funded by the region to, to cover the shortfall, and then we get, we see the former chief of police making a report in the newspaper about a retirement package offered to him that he wasn't even asking for, and that was a pretty hefty retirement package. That really concerns me greatly. Um, and I do understand that in matters of uh, personnel, you can't always discuss the the. Uh, uh, details of, of situations, but could you at least have some explanation for me and for the rest of the public as to why a retirement package would be offered to someone who doesn't want to retire? Thank you, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I can't even comment on the accuracy of that statement, quite frankly, um, and I can't uh, comment on that particular matter bound by contract law. Uh, so. I can't comment on the particulars of that situation. However, it's not unusual when you look at, I know uh, the mayor of St. Catharines had some comment on the matter, yet I question how much was his former CAO paid in a similar scenario. Uh, you know here, 
how often, you know, staffing relationships um, cost money on an ongoing basis. And HR matters are uh, confidential and for good reason. Uh, the Police Services Board uh, made a decision to make it public, to be transparent. In fact, all three of the contracts are on the website right now. The contract that engaged the former chief, his extension, and then the retirement package. It's all there. And so I'm not going to comment on or speculate or, or give um, any opinions on the matter. It's there. The facts are there. And they're online right now. You can take a look. With respect to the um, $2.4 million approximate uh, shortfall that will be funded, again, you know, the region has a taxpayer relief reserve, about $30 million. You put it in the context of how the region, as an example, historically operated. When going into an arbitrated uh, discussions, it was really easy to budget 5 or 6%. And they did regularly, 8 9%. That's how you get 30% in term. They'd have an arbitrated award or, or mutually a, a, a freely negotiated award that's like 3 or 4% then they'd keep the change, it'd be spent on something else or be thrown into a reserve and the public would never know what happened or why their taxes are going up out of control. This is a very clear and transparent um, uh, philosophy of here's exactly why your taxes are going up. And the region has declared in part because of broken provincial arbitration system. Uh, so we are not putting taxes up to put into reserves. But we do have, not unlike the water, wastewater uh, reserve as well, based on usage, sometimes we uh, uh, contribute to reserves, sometimes we take from reserves. This is the same thing. So previous years we've, we've put money into reserves, and this year we're going to take from the reserve. But at the end of the day, it's squared and the world is round. Thank you. Councilor Kennedy and Councilor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'll just go back to the same question I asked the mayor. This vote that was taken, which shows you voting yes as well, was this a defer, a motion to defer, or a motion to accept the region interfering with lower tier municipalities' business? Our mayor tells me that this was a motion to defer. You voted yes. I hardly can see you voting for deferral. But I could be wrong, because I've been wrong before. You're not wrong, Councillor. And I'm happy, to, I'm happy that you know me so well uh, that I would not vote for a deferral. Um, however, it, it was a different motion. <clears throat> the motion that you're speaking of was from the Audit Committee. Those Audit Committee minutes went to full Regional Council. Uh, Regional Council, we didn't even get all the way to the Audit Committee minutes because we were dealing with a motion put forward by Councillor Brian Beatty. Beatty right. He it's, sent me, he, he, I've texted him several times about it, but anyway, okay. Yes, yeah, so that's the one that was voted on. Um, Not a motion to defer though, correct? So, yeah. the, I Get believe the audit, the audit Committee minutes uh, were deferred. The Brian Beatty motion, the Councillor Beatty motion, that which I got did, sent pass. To me, did pass. Yes. That's all I want. I knew you wouldn't vote for the Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barbers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to go back to, um, a little bit back to the McGuire called the retirement that never was. Um, it was reported that Chair Caslin referred to it as a retirement, spoke really well of the chief and spoke of it as a retirement. And then the chief came forward and said, well, no, actually, you know, I, I didn't want to retire. That was an offer I couldn't refuse, kind of reminiscent of the Godfather days and those crazy movies. So I have to ask, in what world is $870,000 plus a car plus a computer, plus an iPad, plus a telephone, plus benefits, which now we're way over $870,000. Um, 
probably well over $900,000, which is just shy of a million bucks. I don't know in what world that is an acceptable um, golden parachute, because I don't even know what else to call it. Um, there was no wrongdoing that anybody uh, alluded to or even hinted at. That's almost a million dollars. That's like, well, it's under half of the deficit that you speak of, but are either of you, do you think like that's good use of public money? And, and that's for either of you as regional councillors. Is that an appropriate use of public monies, almost a million dollars to offer someone to go away? Councillor Barrick. Thank you, Mayor. Again, I'm not going to comment on the context with which the um, question was asked, uh, but I'm going to speak to the facts. Again, all three agreements are on the website. And perhaps the better question to ask is, why would somebody extend a contract one month before a municipal election for three years? You have a five-month contract. You're 18 months to two years in. You've got three more years left. One month before an election, the previous board extends the contract another three years. And so the contract is what this police board inherited no different than contracts you may have with your CEO or other organizations have with their CEOs. All executive directors and general managers and CEOs and, and other uh, uh, individuals in the public service sector at that level are on contracts. And by law, we have to honor those contracts, whether we agree with them or not, quite frankly. And so um, that's probably a more more prudent question to be asked. With respect to the car, the vehicle, Councillor Butters, I couldn't agree more. In fact, I was the one that ended that practice moving forward. Can't do anything about the existing contract, but I can sure make sure new contracts don't include it. And that's exactly what we've done. Mr. Mayor, did you want to respond? I am not in a position to respond because I'm not on the police board. I had nothing to do with negotiation with the uh, former chief, and uh, I uh, accept the uh, response by Mr. Baird. If I may, uh, Mr. Chair, on that note, again, I do not speak on behalf of the Police Services Board. I want to be very clear about that. Any comments I'm making are my own comments. Uh, I cannot and do not speak on behalf of the Police Services Board. Okay, so um, if I could continue through you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, Chairman uh, Bob Gale is the um, chair of the police board, correct? And some of his comments that were reported in the newspaper, and, and I admit sometimes I can be willfully ignorant or hypocritical, and even I can be immature by times uh, by reading such things, but um, his comments were that 2018 um, looks like there will be a deficit as well, and that the reserves of uh, five million dollars will be depleted to cover that and then have to and as you said go to the region for the other two or 2.4 million dollars so with those reserves depleted and to me that means they're empty what happens in 2018 is is chair gale correct in we're looking at another deficit situation in 2018 for the police board thank you mayor council Barry. I I cannot comment on what Chair Gale commented about. I'm not Chair Gale. Um, I will say, though, that the Police Services Board has several reserve funds. The region has several reserve funds. So to be frank, I don't know which uh, reserve lines he's talking about. I can't speak for him. Those, his comments, questions about his comments, are better posed to Chair Gale himself. Well, as a member of the Police Board, do you have concerns about those reserves being depleted at $5 million? And are you telling me that there are other reserves within the police board's, I don't know, cookie jar, like Peter has, you know, his little magic cookie jars and drawers around that we find money, right? Are you telling me that that, that, that happens in the police board, that, that there's like many reserves to be drawn from and that um, you're actually not out of money and 
you're quite confident that there won't be a deficit in 2018 from your own personal knowledge? Uh, thank you. Um, it's February. It's far too early for me to project a surplus or deficit that may or may not occur in 10 plus months. With that said, um, allow me to put it in a little bit of context for, for people. Uh, quite frankly, the region is flush with cash. They have over $140 million in reserves. $140 million in reserves. So am I worried? Absolutely not. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. And someone else may have a question, and I'll jump in when I am. Councillor Demery has a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, clearly, Councillor Barrick is not able to um, answer some of the questions that we have regarding the, the police services situation. So uh, might I request that uh, the city put a request into um, Chair Gale and ask him to come and speak to us about the decisions that have been made and the impact that that's likely to have on, on uh, policing in our community and on our tax dollars? Sure. Uh, would you like to put that in the form of a motion? I certainly would. Go ahead. Do okay, I would I would move that the city of Port Colborne request that Councillor Gale show up at the nearest con at the earliest convenient council meeting um, to answer to uh, to us on his decisions on his board's decisions around the retirement of the for former chief and around the budget shortfall that they're they're facing and what uh, what impact they may or may not have on our tax dollars and on our policing services. Thank you, and I heard a second from Councillor Doucette. Any further discussion? Being none, Councillor Question. All those in favor? Opposed? Councillor Elliott, were you in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Anything further? Mr. Elliott, then Mr. Doucette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through to uh, Councillor Barrick. I, I, I just got a question, something that you stated in a response to Councillor Kenny. With some consternation in your voice, you were shocked that a previous council would extend the chief's contract for five years with one month to go before an election. And who would put a chief in place with a month to go and a new board coming in? Can you tell me the difference between doing that and buying out one chief now seven months before the next election and putting another chief in place so that he would be in place when the election comes around and you wouldn't allow that board to pick their own chief? Uh, just with respect to your timing, that actually happened last spring, last summer. So it's not, that, that actually didn't occur this year. If your question is something that occurred seven months before an election, uh, that's not accurate. But I'm, uh, I'm assuming that, that the placement did take place before the election. So your discussions for semantic purposes took place in the summertime, but you knew full well that the changeover in chiefs would take place seven months prior to an election. So I'm, I'm trying to understand your positioning when you say it's, it's unconscionable that a previous board replaced the chief a month before, but it's okay for your board to replace seven months before. I need some explanation on that. Again, Councillor Elliott, it's not seven months before an election. I don't know where you're getting the seven months from. Again, the contracts are online. The retirement agreement is online with the date. Mm -hmm. That date is not seven months before an election. A new chief was publicly sworn in, very publicly sworn in, last year. Uh, so I'm sorry uh, about the timing of your question with the seven months. It's not accurate. Okay, I'll back it off. You can tell me then, when the chief was sworn in, how many months prior to an election was it? You'll do that for the chair, right, Mr. Elliott? Yes, Mr. Mayor, through you to, the, to Councillor Barrick. How many months was it? That's uh, well over a year. 18 so, months, maybe. So which is about eight, eight, halfway, eight. Just, out, just over halfway midterm. Not during a lame duck potential oh, okay. provision one month before. So what you did was you changed chiefs 
to satisfy your needs for the last number of months of a, of a term and to put one Mr. in Mayor, place so that uh, another order. board didn't have the choice of chiefs that they wanted. It's completely That's, out of order. Mr. Baird. Really? Minis Look, municipalities... Have we're not talking about municipalities. Through the chair. Mr. Okay. Mayor, through you? No, no, through the chair. We're not talking about municipalities. I, I we're talking about the, the police services board. Correct? Is that what we're talking about? Are you finished? Uh, it's my, it's our council chamber. No, because when I try to respond, you uh, jump back in with more questions. So you're going to let me finish? Absolutely. You got the floor. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Elliott knows better. It's no different. Public administration, it's no different than if you were to select a new CAO. It's no different. So if you want to slice, okay, if you're saying it can't be done midterm, it can't be done beginning of the term, it can't be done the end of the term, you're saying it can't be done, I was not elected to rubber stamp. And for you to sit there and suggest that I rubber stamp is irresponsible. I would never stand here and tell you what you can and cannot do with your CAO or when you can uh, approve, extend, deal with the issues that you need to deal with for your local municipality. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I just, just in a quick reply, I, I can't remember telling you what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you the timing around it and when you suggested that a prior board extended a contract for, what, for the chief, how that differentiated between what you, your board did. I didn't say that you had to do anything. I was asking you a simple question. That was all. Do you wish to answer Mr. Barrett, please? I believe I answered it. If it's what's the difference, then how's 18 months? How's midterm instead of one month before an election where everyone else would consider it as lame duck provision? That's your answer, thank you. I have a couple. Uh, no, I have, I have. No, I have a couple extra extra questions. Um, I have. I happened to, to to watch the council meeting. Actually, I watched the I watched the video a few times. Um, and I would heartily encourage people to watch that council meeting on the region's website. Heartily, watch for your enjoyment only. Get some popcorn because it's extremely long. Is there a question? There, there, there is a question. Elliot. And, and uh, it was nice to see you articulate the sociology side of politics with regards to tribalism, in, in which you, you, you lay out what tribalism is defined as. And it's inter interesting that just about everything you, you use as a definition for tribalism applies to the way that the region of Niagara Council is operating right now. So you like, to, you like to say that you lead by example, you're in it to, for, for the constituents, and yet you throw out names like adolescent, immature, willfully negligent, a pathetic attempt, hypocritical, self-contradictions, blatant hypocrisy, indifference to reality. Mr. Elliott, is there a yep. question there, please? Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting to my question. Please Thank you. Do. I will. Can you tell me how that helps the relationship between municipalities and the regional government of Niagara? First of all, thanks for agreeing with me on my definition of what's happening at the region, not just regional council, but around the region, including local municipal chambers. And I got to say I'm a little bit confused, Mr. Mayor, because this very council passed a resolution saying that they oppose, I have it right here, City of Port Comer is strongly opposed to the resolution approved by Niagara Regional Council respecting the financial position of the town of Pelham. You've already said as a council, you don't want the region to talk about it, number one. If the region shouldn't be talking about <coughs> town hall finances, I'm not sure why the city of Port Colburn would want to be talking about the town of Pelham finances. Further, 
The region passed the resolution Thursday night, and that's the will of council. So, you know, it's fair for Councillor Elliott to say things like disgusting, witch hunt, who do they think they are, and now has questions, further questions, after that resolution has been passed, that they don't want the region talking about it. So, how is it not helpful? I don't think it's helpful right now, these types of questions. After the, this very council said, stop talking about it. And the council who made the motion wants to continue to debate that the region's already passed and done with. Just, um, Mr. Mayor, just for a point of clarification, I believe it was Councillor Butters that made the resolution. I just lifted the item. And then it was supported unanimous, unanimously by this whole council. So just one, one final question. Um, you stated earlier with the Police Services Board that prior boards had increases of 8%, 10%, 7%. And then any monies that weren't spent were, were plowed into reserves. Um, and that your board wouldn't do such things like that. Um, you even boast about being the first time in the history of Niagara region having a 0% increase in 2016, which I believe at the end of 2016, the board was short in funding $2.3 million. I stand to be correct. <coughs> but then you stood there and said just now or shortly afterwards that the region has $140 million in reserves. So it wasn't okay for the police board to put money into reserves, but it's okay for the region to plow $140 million into reserves. How do you justify that? Mr. Baird. Councillor Elliott, that $140 million in reserves didn't happen overnight. That's been an overtaxed accumulation from previous councils and previous councils and previous councils. Part of it's on the wastewater, uh, water wastewater bill. So, you know, at what point do you say, okay, I think we've overtaxed enough. We have enough in reserves. Uh, let's, how about doing a better job with respect to greater transparency about where money's being spent? Not jack it up and money you don't need to put it into a reserve and nobody knows how or why or where or how much is even there. So, you know, I, I, gotta, I gotta say, Councillor Elliott can go on and on and on and on and ask questions. My question is, how does he explain such a low attendance record on this municipal council, a record that he's, or has no other record at all, now Mr. grilling Mr. the police board, I grilling the region, difficult, grilling difficult me personally, the relevance of this trying question. to make it look like Although he's doing something. True. Trying to make it look like he's doing something. Okay, I think there's enough. Thanks, to you thank you very much for that. Through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you for making it personal. I really, I appreciate that. Mr. Doucette. You did that. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. There's a tribalism for you. Thank you very much, Here. Mr. Mayor. I have a couple of questions because I personally don't like someone being a bully. And after all, I'm concerned we have someone who, when someone doesn't agree with, with him on region, um, tends to like to call people names and say things like they're ignorant of the fact. Well, if I'm ignorant, Mr. then Mr. I want, I'm going to have questions. No, no, I'm asking you. I've got, I've got the, questions. Have the question. We don't need the... Yo, you, he, if he can and so can everyone else, I'm going to do it as well. We Number one, these. what is the role of the region in, 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 in our municipal affairs? Right here. What is your role for us? In, in our city. And that includes you too, Mr. Mayor, by the way. Is that a threat, Mr. Duke? No, I, I want to know what you think it is. That's no threat. I want to know what you think it is. Question to me. Both a question to you and question to him. I want a question, Mr. Mayor, question answered by both. Question. Mr. Mayor, the Municipal Act states very clearly what jurisdictions are. If <laughs> Councillor Doucette isn't aware, you should ask the city's lawyer or you should ask the CAO. Well, it, does that mean that you don't know? I want an answer because I want everyone in that on that camera to hear what your answer is, because your answer is going to be critical 
to anything else that happens after this. Let me for be, me. Let me be very clear. My role is not to report to you, Councillor Doucette. Okay. But I do know what it is. If you don't know, check the municipal act or ask your lawyer. Okay, I know what it is. Mr. Mayor, what is your role? Vis-a-vis -vis what, Mr. Dutecki? To, for, for the region, to this municipality. Realistically, what is my role? My yep. role is to protect the interests of the city, citizens of the city of Port Comer, and to uh, make sure we have uh, our fair share of the uh, funds that uh, are collected from our citizens and are used for, uh, for uh, our facilities that are under regional jurisdiction. That's Thank how I vision my, my role. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that, and I appreciate what you just said. I have a serious concern with someone at one point. He said it again tonight, okay? There are citizens out there that are asking questions. They come to us, they ask us questions, and then we come back to, uh, to, to the regional councillor. He's here, why not use him? And then turn around and ask him the question. I was told that he wasn't working for me. I'm a citizen, I can ask a question, but he isn't working for me. And when I was told that he isn't working for me, what he meant was, stop asking me questions. That's essentially what he meant. If I'm a citizen in Port Colburn, I want an answer, and if someone else is coming to me, then I would appreciate very much an answer. I do not need anyone to tell me, I don't work for you, so I don't need to answer any of your questions, Mr. which Baird, is what I was told. Mr. Baird, your response to Mr. Uzet? And he just said it a minute ago. Excuse me. First of all, I said I don't report to you, Councillor Doucette. Uh, unfortunately, I still am working for you. There's a difference. I find it highly ironic. First of all, he called me a bully, which is completely uh, wrong. There's nothing in what I said at any time that one could uh, perceive as being bullying. <coughs> Why I find it ironic is because I'm standing here, one person, taking questions from nine aggressive, accusatory, raising their voice. I'm still standing here trying to professionally answer questions, working cooperatively together. This is the tone, this is the welcome, this is the reception, and I'm the bully, nice try. You don't do it here, you do it over there. But anyway, another question that strictly for Councillor Barrett. What is the role of the Audit Committee on Municipal Affairs, this municipality? <coughs> and I have the role of, in, on, on, on the iPad. What is the Audit Committee's role on Municipal Affairs? Mr. Mayor, through you, sir. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if you're referring about a local municipal debt, um, the region does have jurisdiction there. The region co-signs the loan. In fact, you're welcome. Regional Council approved Port Colbert's debenture request Thursday night. And you know, if Regional Council only received it, or if they voted no, the City of Port Colbert wouldn't be getting that money. Is that, is that a threat to the City of Port Colbert? No, that's a no fact. it's already been approved. I'm explaining to you what the jurisdiction is. The jurisdiction, excuse me, through you, sir, I was talking with Peter. Peter sent us out a, a, a thing. And yes, the region does co-sign. And that's the process the Municipal Act requests that we have. And I would have a serious concern that any regional councilor, council as a group would refuse a debenture request, especially if they're way within the boundaries of the Municipal Act debt ceiling. But that okay, so happen. I would like to see, you know. That did not happen. The okay. Regional Council passed those two bylaws, okay. which gave over a million dollars uh, yeah. to the East Village. Okay, great. East Village needed it. And that's, that's fantastic. But I still, the, the, the Audit Committee then 
everything goes to the audit committee and then you guys bring it to the regional council for approval or does it go directly to the regional council but you guys sort of monitor it is that your job as an audit committee I, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand the, the links here so you they seem to be circular if you have a, an opinion or comment to make make it the as a reason no, I'm trying to understand as a regional councillor and as regional council, we are responsible. We have to do due diligence. We have to ask questions. So it goes to, to answer your question, it goes to Corporate Services Committee first. Then it goes to the region. However, committee or council can refer anywhere they want. They can refer to audit committee, they can do this, they can do that, uh, until their diligence is satisfied. And in this case, if the diligence isn't satisfied, then there's a request to go to a body who can get answers, et cetera, and that's what happened recently with the uh, Councillor Beatty motion. I'll leave it for now, sir. Mr. Minor, did I see you This looks like so much fun, I can't resist getting into it. <coughs> Welcome to the Pork Rub Council meeting, Dave. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, um, Councillor Potter. Look, I just want to... I don't want to belabor this Pelham thing because I think it's down the road, but um, I want to give you a little, uh, you know, <clears throat> you said we were willf willfully ignorant. Councillor Butter says sometimes she is, sometimes I am. I like to think of it as different of, of opinion. Uh, you know, I, I certainly could be ignorant of the facts and I'll admit that. But here's my take on that. Here's what I'm worried about. A smaller municipality, and we all have trouble making ends meet on property taxes. You sat around this horseshoe and you've been to budget meetings and you know, you know how it is, it's the same thing at the region. So the town of Pelham has come up with a plan how they want to they or us maybe the region one day won't like the way we're doing it i don't want to see a municipality gun shy of looking for new opportunities to get you know to get some kind of financing that isn't property tax and if they want to move their money around i guess that's where that's where my thought process is and and the reason that um I voted in favor of the motion that, that we passed. So I, I, I know we have a different opinion and um, you know, smarter people than us will make a decision at some point, I'm sure, on Pelham's uh, situation. But I just wanted to give you a thought process. I just don't wanna see municipalities gun shy or, or afraid to look outside the box to get money as long as it's in the, you know, the legal framework, so. Just wanted to get that out there. Thank okay. you, Mr. Bodner. Mrs. Thank you, Mary. Can I, can I, I just want to follow up? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, and say, thanks, Councillor Bodner. I, I appreciate and understand that completely. And uh, again, I want to be clear. I have no issues with any local council resolutions or regional resolutions. My concern is and was not just this council, other councils who passed similar motions of the region being told what it can and cannot vote on, what it should or should not vote on by bodies who, political bodies who vote on things outside of their jurisdiction all the time. Um, so let's just call a spade a spade that on that on that point. Um, the difference, and you know, Port Coburn's adventure request went through no problem because you did everything right. So congratulations. You didn't have uh, 200 Port Coburn residents in the gallery taking every seat, standing room only, with an overflow cloud. Uh, uh, that issue's been ongoing for a couple of years now. Uh, they're very close to their annual repayment limit, possibly over. We don't know. The region doesn't know if it's getting the development charges that the town of Pelham is supposed to collect on its behalf. There's a number of outstanding questions that make that a, um, uh, uh, a more important, sensitive case for the region. 
that is not the same as other municipalities who are well below, you know, 10, 15 percent of the annual repayment limit. Well, we just one question. hold on, Councillor Doucette. I have Councillor Butters here who has a. Okay. I'll let to Mr. Doucette to do a follow up, then I'll come back to you after Councillor Butters. Okay. Councillor Butters? Sorry, I thought you Okay, thank you, Councilor Barry, for that. And I and I know we're going to disagree on other items. I I think we should have be able to talk it out and you know and just uh, move on with it, you know. So thank you, Councilor Butters. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I just have uh, one quick question. I um, actually looked up the. Um, the mandate of the audit committee and you are on the audit committee and so um, one of the things that the audit committee um, can do is uh, audited financial statements of the Niagara region <coughs> boards agencies and commissions so I'm wondering if there are any plans for the audit committee to busy themselves with auditing either the police board or the MPCA Councilor Baird, Councilor Baird. Through you, Mayor, I cannot and will not comment on uh, NPCA, uh, as uh, that's my day job. I have a conflict of interest on that matter. Um, the Police Services Board, uh, 2018, there is not a work plan. Those items, uh, the Police Board in particular, are not on it. The Audit Committee, uh, beyond this Pelham issue, which, by the way, is resolved, in terms of the region's involvement because they've uh, passed a motion to pass it on to the province. But the audit committee and its staff are working on a series of value for money audits with respect to the operations of the Niagara region. Councillor Duzet, back to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Barrick and Mr. Mayor as well, through you. Um, do you see the Niagara region as a parallel service to our citizens or do you consider yourself as a big brother to the municipal the municipalities that you are part of i'd like to know that mr bear i'd like to know your opinion on that thank you through you mayor um my view has always been and councillor bonner noted i sat on this council and the region and municipality, local municipality, are partners in service delivery for residents. I stood here at the beginning of the evening talking about uh, possible tax exemption status for Niagara region housing units to be working in partnership with local municipalities. And I often state that, but um, partnership has to work both ways information sharing, collaboration, cooperation. And I know there's several instances where local municipalities actually uh, communicate with the region first with respect to airports, transit, economic development, uh, and other matters. So yes, we need a strong, positive dialogue. From time to time, as Councillor Bodner said, we will have some disagreements. But that's not to say we can't uh, continue to work together again for the people that we both serve, and that's the residents. Could I have the question again, please? Oh, yes. I would like to know if you think that the region is, should be, it wor works in parallel with us, or is a big brother sort of overseeing us? Well, they region and municipalities, they work together. Uh, the region is not a big brother. Uh, okay. Using your phraseology, yeah, we work in parallel, um, but I think we work... As partners, that's as what partners. I meant by parallel, yeah. Right. That's what I meant by okay. parallel. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Mr. Main, and do you have a question, Mr. Demarain? Okay, go ahead, Mr. Main. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad everybody got this out of their system. Um, I still have a little bit of issues with uh, 
the name calling. You used to be able to settle name calling in the back of the school year, and I was probably pretty good at it back in the day. But I'm not good at it anymore. So when you're talking ignorance and hypocrisy and pathetic attempts, I think I would be very happy, very satisfied, and I know it would probably hurt your feelings, but I would like to have an apology for that reference. And I think that would go a long way. Uh, I think an apology might be in order of members of council to Mr. Barrick and perhaps Mr. Barrick to members of council. This goes back to meetings when intemperate comments were made, which were not necessary. Are you referring to the comments that I made, no, Mr. Mayor? No, not any comments that you made. Um, I'm confused now. Okay. All I asked for was, I think, I deserve an apology, and uh, whether you can say yes or whether you can say no, I asked the question. I'm not sure you need an apology. I don't think you, your name was taken in vain, but Mr. Barrick, uh, nope. perhaps you will uh, comment. Okay. Councilor Main, the request had to come from you, right? It makes, makes it very difficult, but I got to say, look, we all have to have a thick skin. And so it's easy for some people to dish it out and maybe not take it. I'm not saying who who, I'm not saying this council as a whole. But ignorance simply means not knowing. And so, and there's many instances where local councils, not just this one, truly don't know certain things with which the region has jurisdiction of, or what they're working on, et cetera. The hypocrisy piece, again, uh, there's very clear recent examples, not only local councils, but regional council. So uh, I think as far as I can go is I may have been able to choose my words a little bit more carefully, but that doesn't mean that they were incorrect. And I don't know if that's enough of an olive branch for Councillor Maine. I have utmost respect for you, Councillor Maine. I know we've worked well together to serve the residents in your ward, and I hope we can continue to do that. I think that's a stretch, uh, an apology, but uh, if Mr. Main is happy with that comment. Uh, Mr. Mayor, have you ever seen me happy? <laughs> well, <laughs> I can't tell when you're happy or unhappy. Happy or is my stash for a Is that an order for Mr. Main? I'm done. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is probably for everybody, but uh, Councillor Barrick, you in particular um, did incite a lot of bad feelings amongst this council when you made those comments publicly. Um, to pick up the paper and read things like that being said about you is really upsetting. It's considering that I don't ever remember saying anything publicly about you at all. So to have that aimed at me was not a fun thing. And I know there are other council members here who would say exactly the same thing and be right in that. So would you owe an apology? I believe you would, but you know what? Sorry doesn't make a dead man come alive, and if you don't mean something, it's not worth the, the words that it takes to say it. So this, having said that, we need to be able to go forward from this. We're not little kids out in the schoolyard. We need to be able to lay down the swords and get on with the business of running you running the region and us running the city. That has to happen, and we have to have a decent working relationship to do that. So I would just suggest that we rise up out of this new low stop any of this and just move forward and get the work done. We're clearly, uh, as a council, we're not going to get the answers we're looking for. And um, we're certainly not going to get the apology. That's, that was made abundantly clear. So let's move forward from there and just get the work done. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Demery. Mr. Barrick. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, yeah, I know how you feel when you open the paper, you see negative things written about you, said about you on a regular basis, probably more than all of you combined, quite frankly. And uh, so from this council, maybe not council as a whole, but certain individuals, and I said them before, words like disgusting and witch hunt, who do they think they are, et cetera, et cetera. So look, Mayor Maloney articulated from the beginning. Um, I'm taking my lashings, and I'm not standing here requesting an apology. It is what it is. Do I want to continue working with this council? Absolutely. Why? Because um, it's the residents that matter. And so I won't stop working on behalf of that residence, and that's one thing we have in common. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I believe we've covered everybody. I'd like to move on on our agenda.
Any counselors' items uh, that wish to bring up with members of the staff? Any issues or inquiries? Uh, Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. I guess just to, just to start off with uh, throw some roses out to the uh, to our newest newest director in your department, to, mm -hmm. actually in uh, community and economic development, um, with regards to the uh, sports fest. Um, I know that uh, I saw Yvonne there, but the sledge game uh, between the Canadian Olympic team and the uh, the USA Olympic team was nothing short of unbelievable. Um, I played hockey a long time. I don't think I've ever seen anything <laughs> as rough as that. It was absolutely edge of your seat excitement. Oh, yeah. And to publicly thank your department, but I think in particular, and I don't want to miss anybody, but just to center somebody out, uh, Brian Thiel put it together, was the point of contact uh, for the city with the Canadian Olympic team and did an absolutely fabulous job. As uh, you said, Mr. Mayor, the parking lot, you couldn't get a parking spot. Mm -hmm. You could hardly get in, let alone find a spot. <coughs> and I know that wasn't just uh, to do with the, the uh, sledge game. It had to do with the baseball that was going on, too. And I saw a clip on, uh, on cable that uh, one participant said they've never been to a snow pitch tournament with as many participants as this one. So uh, congratulations to you and the department. Um, I saw Brian there told him it was absolutely fantastic. So uh, kudos to you and, uh, and the department. Pass that along, please. I'm going to say on behalf of council, oh, yeah. not only yep. me, it was yep. extremely well done. So yep. thank you for that. Um, just, a, just a quick, uh, couple of the quick uh, questions. Um, I'm going to put this to Chris and Dan because I'm not exactly sure. Dan, <coughs> over here. Dan stepped out. Okay, Chris, I'll throw it to you. He's coming back. He's coming back? Yeah. I, had a, I had a question from a resident that I didn't know how to answer, and I kind of got a reply from bylaw in, it, in, it, in regards to snow plowing. And the issue was the snow plow had gone by their house. Then they went and parked their car on the road after the plow had gone by. Oop. Later that day or the next day, bylaw showed up and put a notice on their car that they had to move their car. It hadn't snowed, the road was plowed. And the resident asked bylaw, why do I have to do this? And the statement was, because we're coming back to clean up and plow again. So the question was, how do I know after the original plow that the city's coming back to replow again and you have to keep your car off the road? I didn't know how to respond. So, two things. It's a communication issue. And what do we tell people when they ask, once the snowplow goes by, are we good to park on the road or aren't we? Mr. Lee? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Elliott. Um, it's a very good question, and we've actually, among staff members in the last uh, few days and with the number of snow events that we've been having, we're actually trying to, for lack of a better term, fine-tune that process of communicating. Um, I know there's been discussions just today alone with regards to um, how bylaw would communicate, how public works would communicate to bylaw, and then subsequently getting that onto Twitter feeds, Facebook, all of these social media outlets that we have available to us. <clears throat> There's discussions with the uh, communications officer now that the city has, so that'll be happening in that regard, realizing that we have to get that out there to give people warning. Um, that's the intent moving forward, and we hope to be as accommodating as possible. I mean, we're not going to catch everybody. We realize that, hence all of the different um, connections and methods of putting that out there. Um, it's encouraging that they actually came and knocked at the door, so that was a good thing. <laughs> but uh, we are we are in the process of uh, trying to make things better and better each and every event. Um, like I said, staff members have been uh, communicating. There's actually a meeting planned tentatively for this week to sit down with the committee, which Councillor Main is a member, and we'll be discussing more of those initiatives and how to go about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I. And I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves.
But if somebody parks on the road after the plow has initially gone by, would we ticket or tow them? For you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Elliott, after the plow has gone through, the only, uh, in this particular instance, what you're referring to, I'll use as an example, if it's a cleanup activity after the event, uh, something in the downtown core, for instance, where we want to clean up. If we've gone through with the initial plow, the intent is that we want to get those streets cleaned up a day or a day and a half or two days after. That's most likely what's happening in this case. I know there's crews that'll be uh, doing that type of thing starting tomorrow. They're putting the blowers on and things of that nature. So that would be the second notice after the initial plowing. Okay. Do we, and, and just, just to follow on with that, as far as notification goes and communication, and, and this, this seems to be part of the problem, and it could probably throw it to the committee as well for your meeting. The communication thing is, is paramount. Um, I just got my, I just got my tax bill. And I got to come before council and argue my tax bill. Um, but there was no notification in it on anything from the city. No, no news, no flyers, no anything like that. Do we hard copy parking, snow parking rules in any water bills or tax notices that we send out so that people without electronic communication can receive it? So, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Elliott, the winter control procedure is what we've done on the staff level. We've advertised that in the newspaper. It's online. But no, they have not been included in any tax bills. For those on social media, it's on Facebook. Too. Yeah. Yes. And, that, and that's, and, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, sorry. And that's, that's my issue. If somebody's not connected, um, how do they know? So is there any way that with any of our billing system, we can get those beginning to let people know and then maybe Mr. Sands, pack them in later on, on just for as a re-notification? Yeah, our, our tax bills normally are going out in February and June, so you sort of miss the, um, the timing for, for winter uh, events. Um, that's the only problem. It could go out in February, but we're already through December and January, which is a major part of your snowfall. Um, and June is too early. So water bills do go out um, quarterly. So we do. there is a water bill that goes out in December, January. Um, again, it's sort of in the middle of the season. Um, but I know that, you know, putting it on um, all, all our social media, the web pages, City Hall news that, that goes out, uh, that type of thing is there's there's other avenues that we that we can put it out there, um, but I think putting in the we can put things. Don't get me wrong, we can do inserts with our uh, our new tax bills and our water bills because uh, they're they're one pagers, so we can do inserts. Um, it's just we have to look at the timing of when those are going out and what uh, information we want to put out that it is on a timely fashion. Just one follow up question on that. Would it be prudent to maybe just do a mass mailer to all addresses without it being in our mailings? If we could just do like a flyer, kind of a flyer mail out to every address just, just to let people know, you know, September, October, maybe even November, just so that we can hit every address. And because I know if you do tax bills, it may not go to the, the tenant in the building. And I'm not sure the water bills would hit every every tenant as well if they don't own the business own the home um, but some way that we can get it out to everybody to let them know through you uh, mr mayor to Councilor Elliott. Um, actually we're one of the reasons for having the meeting when we are having the meeting is so that if there are any budgetary items that may require special funding we've uh councillor may and i've already had that discussion earlier so that's why we're pushing this meeting so forward in this week, hopefully, so that we can bring that forward when we get to those discussions. If we need to budget X number of dollars to do an annual or a biannual mail up, that, that can be considered at that time by council. Thank you. I just got uh, two quick other things. I'd ask uh, in a previous meeting um, if we could get a report on uh, federal funding programs that we didn't apply for. And the reason I know that there was uh, some questions about why we hadn't applied for any funding programs. Um, <coughs> is that close at hand? 
the next meeting or two? Through uh, Mr. Mayor to Councilor Elliott. Yes, staff's working on that. Uh, multiple departments are obviously involved in that equation, so uh, we're working through the nuts and bolts, so to speak. And uh, we hope to have that in the very near future. <laughs> near? Very near? Very near. Perfect, thanks. I'm good. Any other councilors' comments or inquiries? Councilor Demery and Councilor Kenny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a, a couple of items. Um, first, just to, to add to the issues around snow removal, and, uh, and this is in particular the job that the city's been doing in this, this last couple of weeks of snow. I think it's been a great job. I, I'm, there's been a lot fall, and uh, there's been a good response to it. So it, it, although you always have a few problem areas, for the most part, it was a really good job, and that, that's a good thing to say. Having said that, though, I did have someone send me a copy of the notification she received when she put a complaint into bylaw um, about snow removal. And she was really upset with the tone of the, the message. And I'll, I'll basically read what, what it says. Um, it, goes, it starts to saying that they will investigate, and that's fine. Um, and then it goes on to say that the bylaw enforcement division deals with vehicles interfering with snow removal as follows. And it says, complaints that are received via email shall have a priority sequence. The number one priority would be anything coming out of engineering and operations. Then it would be out of fire emergency services. Then the CAO, including complaints from counselors. Then senior staff. Then the general public. And then the fourth item is proactive, whatever that means. She took that to mean that public is really the bottom of importance. So I, really, I would suggest we rejig this this message that comes out. This is an automatic response that comes out uh, when somebody levels a, a, a bylaw complaint. So if we could find a way to rejig that, it would be a good idea. It just sounds bad, and I, I can understand where it probably was meant a little differently, but it doesn't get received that way. So um, that's something that we should be doing. Mr. Aquiline, can you address that? To you, Mr. Mayor, to Council Demore, I will certainly bring that up. Okay. But I can say that Council has, as a policy, approve the pecking order, so to yep. speak, for complaints. Yep. That yep. has come to Council, and that's been the policy that Council has approved in the past, but <coughs> certainly I can revisit. Okay, and I do understand that. I just it, It's just that when the public receives something like this, it really tells them they're, they're sort of down there as far as who matters, and that doesn't sound right. So it, it, has, to be, it has to be done differently. Anyway, okay, so that was, that was one. And again, like I say, the snow removal has been really good considering the amount of snow that we've seen falling. Um, and I've personally seen tickets on cars, so uh, that, that system is working, which is good. I'm sure those cars are gonna think twice. When they've got a $75 ticket on their car. They'll think twice before they're gonna go park that again. So that, that's a good thing. So, all right, that, having said that, um, I was also, um, I had a knock on the door today and there was a man with a tag in his hand from the SPCA. And the tag said, we have reason to believe you have dogs on your premises and it, you, mu you know that you need to license them. And it went on to explain the licensing uh, rules and regulations and who to contact to get a license put in place. So I thought that was kind of interesting because that's never happened before. So I called the number on there and found out they're doing a program, the SPCA is doing a program where they're going to do a knock and drop at every single home in Port Colborne. If they have reason to believe that there have been dogs, that you'll get the tag I got. Otherwise, you're getting another tag saying, if there are dogs on this premises, this is what you need to do. So it's a good thing to do. Um, and, you know, it, it makes sense to me. But I did get a call from someone right after that, ask, or right, sorry, right before that, asking me, what happens to the money that is collected? And I couldn't give the answer. Um, now, obviously, it's $15 for a, a dog that has been spayed or neutered. So what happens to that money? It comes into the city of Port Colborne. What do we do with it? So, Peter, I think this one's for you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the, um, there is actually, um, and, and Dan can correct me or, or add to this, but uh, we, we have um, the dog tags we don't sell directly out of City Hall anymore, as you know, and it, it's through uh, DocuPet. DocuPet. And so they are the ones that are actually, um, it's online, so you purchase online, it's one tag, um, and it's, it's, it's annual that you would, you get the one tag, but you have to annually pay the fee. So uh, there's a portion of that fee they keep, and the balance of that fee comes to the city of Port Coburn, and it's part of our 
uh, budget to cover our, some of our operating costs uh, for the uh, Humane Society, the, the shelter and the, and the cost of the Humane Society. So those revenues go towards that. Okay, thank you. That's, that's exactly what I wanted to know about that. Sorry, that, that uh, is done. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the Roma Conference. Uh, Barb Butters and I went to the Roma Conference, which is a rural Ontario municipality conference that was held in Toronto. Um, and it was a really good conference. We brought back loads and loads of information to share with the CAO, who I'm sure is going to get tired of hearing from us, um, and great new ideas that we may or may not be able to implement in Port Colborne. So it was a, it was a good thing. Lots of educationals took place. Um, we spent uh, three, two solid days of running, uh, starting with 8 o'clock in the morning sessions, finishing at about 6 o'clock at night. So we went all day, lunch sessions and all. These things are jam-packed and they're, they're really good. The days go by like a blur, but lots of good information. And um, as a result of, of visiting many of the booths that were there, uh, one, of the, one of the distributors that were there were, um, um, they were talking about smart cities and, and all of what that means. And I know that um, MP Badaway has been talking about smart cities. So I thought, well, I'll stop there and talk to them. Well, it, I, I got a little bit interesting after having that conversation. And when I got back, the CAO and I attended um, Mr. Badaway's um, his educational, his informational sessions on smart cities, and we, we were pretty encouraged about what, what uh, Port Colborne may or may not be able to do. So I think we're going to he be hearing more about that in the near future. That was it was a good thing, but uh, all in all, I think it was a pretty productive uh, week last week, even though I, or two weeks ago, rather, even though we missed uh, quite the council meeting. So uh, otherwise, it was it was a good time though. Anything? Uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you. This is. Mrs. Kenny. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Mr. Aquilina. Mr. Aquilina, I just wondered if we were, the city itself was training new staff. I had a taxpayer call me and say that um, he saw our senior bylaw enforcement officer with another officer um, ticketing a car that rightly so should have been ticketed, but two of them were there. And he simply asked the question, does it take two people to drive here to give out a ticket? And the smart answer he got snapped back to him, and he was insulted by that, was, ask your counselor. And the person walked away. He was not impressed, so he asked me, and I said, well, maybe we're training somebody. And he goes, training somebody to give a taxpayer an answer like that. So I'm just wondering if that, if you have an answer, were we training a new individual? And if we are training a new individual, would you please ask them to be a little bit more respectful to the taxpayer? Thank you. Mr. Aquilina. Through you, Mr. Mayor to Councillor Kenny, I'm not aware of the actual conversation taking place. That's news to me. I can inform Council that this weekend we had staff working overtime to write tickets. So there was someone driving and the other officer was actually writing the ticket. So the officers the two officers were working but the other people were not they were employees of the department but they were not municipal law officers so i'm not aware of the actual comment that was made but i will certainly look into it thank you thank you mr aquilina mrs butters thank you mr mayor um yeah just um two things quickly um and the one is for my husband he says make sure that you tell whoever it is that runs the greater He's doing a really good job. <laughs> so consider it done, husband. That that guy's doing a great job on the grader. So if you could pass that on. <laughs> Do it out our area anyways. Um, so anyway, I just want to just say briefly about the, the Roma conference. It's uh, one of those ones that I think is worthwhile to go to. The topics that they cover were um, pretty, pretty uh, <coughs> pretty broad and varied. Um, Angie went one way, I went the other way. We covered as much ground as we could. So there was things on public libraries and wastewater and Bill 68 and um, I even uh, a legalization of recreational marijuana, challenger opportunity, um, municipal wastewater and wastewater system owners, um, just uh, social media for municipalities uh, keeping community schools open, like just all the different kinds of things that um, that we were able to cover with uh, two of us going. So um, I would urge anybody in the future, if you can go to Roma, go. It, they really put on a good 
um, a really good, really good sessions and lots of interaction. Um, I learned a lot of things, and I really appreciate the opportunity to go and bring back to to this community. That's all I got. Thank you. Uh, just a question: Does uh, Roma provide written materials that uh, we can we can obtain and circulate to other members of council? Mr. Mayor, if I could, they, they will send us packages of the various informationals and that sort of thing. I think I provided one last, last year to the CAO, but uh, they will send packages and further information from some of the presenters. And all the ministries also send packages. So there's lots of, lots of information that will be coming. Thank you. Moving on now to, uh, yes, Mr. Bodner. Certainly you may. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to thank Councillor Damaris and Butters for going to that conference. You know, so often, uh, you know, the odd time taxpayers will say, yeah, while well, you're up there having fun and everything. I've been to those. Those are grueling days. They are long. I mean, if you're interested in hitting all of those, which I know you guys were, it's, it's a long days, but the information that comes back is, uh, is usually pretty good, and that's a great way to get it. And we were invited to one party, but we were both too pooped. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bob. I've seen the pictures on Facebook, sorry. <laughs> oh, I, now I'll ask my question, Mr. Mayor, if I could. Through you to uh, Dan or Chris, um, another thing about snow plowing. Somebody on a rural road, uh, Cedar Bay Road to be exact, is pushing snow uh, out from, their, from two driveways, um, and it's not really, they usually push it and put it in the ditch, you know, across the road. It's just about where the wheel of the car would be coming the other way. Um, so what's the um, process now? Do we need to phone in when somebody sees that, that they need to phone in the address of the, and how does it, what happens? Is there a fine? And if you can enlighten me on that, thanks. Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Bonner, our bylaw actually states you cannot put your snow onto the municipal road allowance. So if that is taking place, call into bylaw enforcement and provide the address and we will investigate. <coughs> if I call in or a resident calls in, is that taken care of like right away? Because the way these two piles were, they were at least 20 inches high, uh, pushed by a tractor. And you, in the daytime, you can go around them, right? But at night, when you meet another car, that would take the skirt right off of any car that's, uh, that's low and actually could send somebody maybe in a panic into the ditch. So, so what happens? They call in. Is it, you know, within the hour, two hours? Is it two days? If you can tell me that. Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Bonner, if it's a safety concern, that's a priority. So bylaw enforcement would up that up on their list of complaints, so it would it be a priority to address. We're good? Okay, move on to any staff responses to previous counselor inquiries. Counselor, er, <coughs> Chief Cartwright. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, further to what the mayor uh, spoke to when he first made his comments with regards to the fire, uh, I was away for the first part of it, did, did attend the, uh, uh, the end of it, uh, the last several hours. I just want to add my thanks to the municipalities that assisted us, and the mayor was correct in the numbers he, in the names he called out. I would like to also add to that the chiefs and the uh, deputies that attended to assist Mike, uh, although our people did a, what I consider to be a great job from all reports that I've received, uh, those officers certainly stepped up and helped him in many, many ways and they would have had to do so even if I had been here. You need to understand that that type of fire is kind of uh, perhaps once in a career type fire where you've got that many municipalities coming in, working together with a number of firefighters over a period of 36 to 48 hours uh, because there's all kinds of other issues that come into play, whether or not uh, you've got to worry about water containment, which we did in this, in this particular case, trying to make sure we use as little water as possible and contain what water was there because there's pollution issues. The Ministry of the Environment gets involved uh, because of air and water. 
uh, because of where it's situated, basically it's surrounded by water. We had one way in, one way out, which complicates things. Um, there's all kinds of things that come into play with that. Over and above uh, command and control of the situation, the safety of personnel, and I'd like to say that with the exception of one muscle pull from a firefighter out of Welland, there was no injuries whatsoever in that particular incident. So I think our personnel and the people that assisted this community in a time of need certainly did a great job. I'd also like to say that uh, the St. Catharines Fire Department, the dispatch office answered hundreds, literally hundreds of calls from all kinds of agencies and concerned citizens uh, over and above what they do for our dispatching purposes and that of the other six municipalities that were involved. Um, I have seven pages of dispatch information that they, uh, they collected and provided to us and there's more to follow with regards to who was coming, what time they were dispatched, what time they went on there, what time they got on location and the various things that occurred during the course of that. So I think St. Catharines Fire Department who is our dispatch agency did a great job as well. I'd also like to thank uh, Public Works. Our Public Works personnel assisted our people to no end with regards to uh, keeping, keeping our water supply going as best they could. Uh, they also assisted us with fuel issues. Uh, we have fuel issues in the city and at this particular time we had trucks in operation. We couldn't take them out so we had to bring a fuel supply into the fire scene and they were able to uh, provide fuel to our trucks. Um, I believe the bill will be somewhere between twelve and fifteen hundred dollars. So that's a lot of fuel. Uh, additional to that, uh, Welland Transit stepped up when they were contacted with regards to supplying a bus to assist us with uh, a rehab center, a large rehab center, because of the numbers of people, and that certainly was appreciated. Another person that was very important, although it's outside of the, the fire situation, was our new position, our communication marketing coordinator. Who worked very, very closely. Michelle worked has worked with us for the last year and a half or so in her temporary position. Certainly she stepped up when this occurred, um, up to and including three days afterwards, right up until the Friday of, uh, of this past weekend, and assisting in getting re news releases out, coordinating all of the, the press conferences. Uh, it really is a big undertaking that, quite frankly, I'm glad to get rid of because I can make one phone call now and she has all the contacts, she'll do all the work. All we have to do is provide her with the time and a place and she'll make all the other arrangements. So that's a big relief from our perspective, especially during the course of an emergency. And I think it's a position that uh, council will find in the future to be very, very positive uh, for this community as a whole, because quite frankly, uh, there's all kinds of things that she can play a role in with regards to the community. Um, uh, there's two other things if I could just add, if you don't mind. The flyer issue, it's interesting that that came up here tonight with regards to information flow and snow plowing. I'll tell you that uh, we met today when I say we, the administration of the fire service, and we, we are continuing with our smoke alarm program next year. And one of the things we're doing is we're designing a, 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 like a, a, a large, and we stole it off of Niagara Falls Fire Department. They used it in Chippewa. It looks like a, a large uh, folder. It's a, it's a straight thing with all kinds of information on it. And we're, we're going out and getting prices from the post office to do both a mass mailing and areas. We're going to be specific to certain areas where we can put these to every mailbox. So it might be helpful and maybe we can coordinate that through Michelle. She's helping us with that too. So that's a contact that may already be in place. Once she has it for us, she'll have it for others within the corporation. <clears throat> the other thing I'll just talk about if I could briefly, again while I was away, there was a, a structure fire in Lewis Street. Uh, in one of the buildings that we've had a number of contacts with and as council certainly is aware and probably the public is, we've pushed uh, our smoke alarm program in residential homes. Well, while that was going on, uh, Scott, uh, through the cooperation of uh, us, when I say us, the fire service as a whole and the council as a whole, has been pursuing multi-residential properties both on the east and on the, on the west side of the canal. This particular building was visited by Scott and our, on our firefighters and uh, they went in and they made sure that there was working smoke and carbon oxide alarms and this particular property did have a kitchen fire and even though you may read in Facebook, I don't have Facebook but I'm certainly told what's on Facebook because my other half has it so I get to sit at night and listen to or read it to me but that's beside the point. Apparently there was comments passed there that there's no working smoke alarms. Well I'll tell you there was working smoke alarms in that particular property and they did alert to the fact to the other people in that um, building that there was a fire in that building and they were able to get them out of the building. So uh, again, that's another positive thing for our programs. 
uh, it paid another dividend, whereas I consider that to be another save in, in our community because of the efforts of our people and that of council, the support of that in the community as a whole. So that's all I have for now, and if there's no questions, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any questions of the Chief? Mr. Chief. Councilor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Through to Chief. Um, I had a few people ask uh, about the Vinyl Works fire and why we didn't draw water off the canal. I just know that we can't, but I don't know the technical reason why. So if you could get it out there why we didn't pump out of the canal onto the fire no. instead of running tankers, that'd be great. Your, your Worship, through you, I will tell you, we did pump water out of the canal. We used portable pumps. Um, obviously that takes time because you've got to cut holes, you've got to access it and everything else. But we did pump water uh, out of the canal using portable pumps, obviously you couldn't put a, an apparatus on it. We couldn't get in close enough because of the thickness of the ice. You got about 30 to 36 inches ice in parts there. So it made it kind of difficult. But I will share with council that a number of years ago when the previous owner of that, the owner of that property is a federal, it's a federal property. So if I could just take a second to share the, the, the problem with federal property is the fire service has no authority to enforce the Ontario Fire Code on federally owned land. So Mike and I went there when it was owned by, it was, I believe it was Marsh Engineering years ago, and we asked them at that particular time to consider putting in a dry hydrant so that we would have water accessible to us for this particular case, this particular need. And, and they refused to do it because they don't have to because we're only, only provincial. So that in itself is, is a bit of an issue for us. We did draw it as best we could with portable pumps off after we cut holes, but we ended up using seven tank trucks. I will have a, a number of gallons we use. I'll report that to council at a later date because I don't have that total at this time. We're still trying to find out what that number was of municipal water supply versus an approximation of what water would have been used out of the, at 400 gallons a minute, two pumps. Uh, I don't really know how many hours at this particular time, but we're going to do as best as we can estimate on. So that's a bit of an issue, and, and if I could just take a split second to take a little longer, even the fire investigation was very, very complicated because the Office of the Fire Marshal has no authority to do a fire investigation. We have no authority to do a fire investigation. So we had to contact the, the not the fire commissioner's office, but we had to contact the Seaway Authority, who quite frankly disappointed me because they never even showed up at the fire. That's another whole issue for us. That's going to be dealt with. So we had to deal with them, and they in turn had to do with their head office in Kingston, and they had to get their attorneys involved to give us a written letter of authority to be able to go on the property to do all that. So it's very complicated. Um, so we're going to enter into a joint agreement. That's our plan. But the reality is uh, we got through it all and uh, without injuries. That's all I can say. Thank you, Chief. Are there any other inquiries, uh, Mr. McWilliam? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I recall, I believe it was Council Doucette asked about the number of tickets we've issued for parking during winter operations. And I can report that as of January 1st, 2018 to today, 95 tickets have been issued, zero cars have been towed. I can also say that um, there are a lot of people that are challenging the parking tickets through the screening review. I've dealt with some uh, upset individuals and I told the one individual that I will bring it to council and raise your displeasure with council that these parking tickets are taking place. That's, that, that's what I said I would do. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Aquilina. Uh, Mr. Mr. Aquilina, I, thank you very much for that. I think that's important to understand. And, and it's critical to understand that the towing has to happen or the car has to get out of the way. And I'm looking down Christmas Street from my house and the truck slows down to two kilometers an hour to be able to swing because there's cars on each side. He has to swing his wing one way and lift it and then swing it the other way to be able to get past. And that's the reason why we need this. And if anyone thinks they shouldn't have to pay it, send them to me, give them my phone number. I'll show them the danger, okay, for the cars as well as for our employees, okay? I'll show them where the danger is. And, and, and it's, it's, I, I watch them all, I've been watching them all, all winter and it's unbelievable how graceful they can maneuver those big trucks. It's unbelievable. 
So I, it's, it's critical that we continue this, and it's critical that people understand they've got to get off the road. Simple as that. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Set. Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to go back to what the Chief was saying a few minutes ago about the fire on Lewis Street. I find it very helpful when uh, Mike in particular tweets a lot about fires as they're going on, and then Michelle usually puts something out that's uh, more formal in, in, in content. But um, I tend to share, I will retweet the tweets, and I know that Councillor Elliott has been doing that as well because I see them happening. And uh, I sometimes will see Councillor Desette pop in, and when it comes to Facebook, Councillor Butters pops mm -hmm. in, but we try to share as much as possible. So the more you guys can put out initially, the more it gets shared and the truth is actually spread faster than the rumors. So it's, it's it's a good thing. Are there any other staff responses to previous councillor inquiries? Councillor <laughs> Councilor Sones. Councillor Sones. <laughs> <laughs> Moving up. Um, no, I just wanted just to remind uh, Council of our uh, budget meetings March 5th and March 6th and March 14th, and hopefully March 14th we'll have a past budget. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sinet. There being nothing uh, further on uh, consideration of various items, we'll move on to uh, consideration of those items requiring separate discussion. As item number one, um, there were three councillors who requested this item, Councillor Kenny, Councillor Butters, and Councillor Bodner. Uh, would someone like to move the recommendation of I those can do three? That, sir. Just one second, yeah. Moved by Councillor Kenny. Seconded by Councillor Butters. <laughs> Discussion? Yes, sir. Uh, planning and Development Planning Division Report number 2018 14, subject recommendation report proposed new comprehensive zoning bylaw. Any further <coughs> comment? This is the, uh, the area where Mr. Anger had some mm -hmm. concerns. Correct. Did I agree to move in a seconder first for that? I moved it, so. I seconded. Sure. Councillor Doucet seconded it. Okay. So um, just in, in that uh, report, um, as when he came to the podium, I've asked that number, uh, I mean, uh, resident 679 Elm Street be exempt um, in the uh, Schedule A7. As council support for that, please. I suppose that would that be an amendment to the original Correct. bylaw? Correct. We have we have several several people that have added stuff, but um, his came late, so I'm asking that that um, that be added to the ones we have received as well. Do we have uh, the others, Mr. Aquilina? They're all in our report, sir. Moved and seconded uh, amendments to the original zoning bylaw. Mr. Mayor, all of the the recommendation report tracks all the changes that are being made from the draft zoning bylaw. So the only thing that's not included in this recommendation report is the item that Councillor Kenny has noted an amendment be made to include Schedule A7 be changed from R4 to R2. Okay. All right, that uh, amendment to zoning bylaw has been made and seconded. Can we vote on the amendment first? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. That's complete, Mr. Anger. Now can we... Uh... Yes. This is what, uh, uh, do you have a question, Mr. Elliott? Yeah. yeah. Can we ask questions about yeah. the rest of the report? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Councillor Butters has some questions. Too. Go ahead, Barb. She had her... You... Okay. I recognize Mr. Elliott first. Go ahead, Mr. Elliott. Yeah. Uh, just a couple quick questions uh, through you, Mayor to Dan. Um, with regards to, uh, I guess it's page 34, 36, sorry, of our package. Um, under comment section, uh, it's in the uh, Mr. Wells' comments. Um, down at the bottom of the comments, it says, Port Coburn Quarry has already received planning approvals for their existing operations. Any changes to the zoning provisions can't be supported at this time. I know that they had come before council to ask the change in their zoning. So is this our position right now? That you, that planning department can't support any zoning, uh, any changes to the zoning provisions now, in the future, or what does that statement entail? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor to Councilor Elliott. The comment is nothing to do with the actual applications before Council for official plan and zoning changes. Council has not made a decision on that. So those requests are not for consideration under this zoning bylaw. So the request that Councilor, uh, sorry, the, the request that Council, the request that Mr. Wells was making, they could not be supportable because they, those changes would change the whole zoning for the entire property. I don't, didn't think that was prudent that be done through the zoning bylaw change. Okay, so that was a comment towards Mr. Wells' comments. Correct. Okay, and one other quick question. Um, uh, in the comment section, uh, Mr. Fraser for Rankin Construction, uh, it deals with the um, maximum gross floor area, building height, and yard set setbacks to allow for greater residential intensification. Um, can you speak to that? And that is applicable to the entire downtown commercial core, correct? Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor, to Councilor Elliott, that is correct. The zoning for the downtown would have those new provisions that would enable Rankin Construction to construct a five to six story residential dwelling building, but that's applicable to all the downtown core. Okay, so, so the, the new height um, change is now six stories, which is applicable throughout downtown? That's correct, sir. Okay, thank you. Councilor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Mr. Aquilina. Um, this also deals with uh, which uh, on page 37, and um, I have some questions about accessory lot coverage. So I see that in here, the, you, get, you increase it from 3% to 5%, and, um, and then an overall uh, lot coverage uh, to 15% from 10. So my, one, my first question is, why is there a difference between serviced lots in in, I guess I guess you say in the urban area, and unserviced lots. Is, why is there a difference? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Butters, the difference is, in, in the rural area, you have to accommodate a septic system, which you don't have to do because you're on municipal services. So that's what the difference is with lot coverage. And, and wouldn't there, the but wouldn't with the region, it, like, cause, because the region is what determines, you know, how, big a septic system you need and what even like why isn't it the region's i don't know jurisdiction for that like i'm not sure i understand because if the region came in and said you need x x size then obviously you know you either have room or you don't have room for whatever sized building an accessory building like a shed or a garage right or wrong to Mr. Mayor to Councillor Butters, that is correct. The region, they're the approval authority for septic systems. So any property that is on private services has to have a large enough property to accommodate those systems. So when you look at some of the properties, especially on the Lake Erie shoreline, they're not as big as some lots that are elsewhere in the municipality that are on municipal services. So looking at a lot itself, it needs to be large enough to accommodate those systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in um, the information that um, Ron Barda and Heather McDougall gave to me, they indicate that there are actually quite a few of the municipalities surrounding us that have a higher percentage for that accessory lot coverage. And so the city of Thorold, 10%. Norfolk County, 10, Pelham, 10, St. Uh, St. Catharines, 10, Grimsby, 10, Town of Lincoln, 10. Uh, they include the city of Waterloo for some reason, 10%. Niagara on the Lake, 8%. Uh, West Lincoln, 8, Fort Erie, 7, and Wayne Fleet, 5 to 7%. So it seems like an awful lot of them are are quite a bit higher than ours. Is what What's your rationale? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Butters, the whole premise behind accessory law coverage, yes, you need to accommodate your septic systems, but it really has to do with storm water runoff. The more buildings on the property, more surface, the permeability on those properties aren't the same, and then you deal with flooding. 
So a lot of the accessory coverage has to do with stormwater management. Okay. And so in our municipality, are you saying that, it, that that's more of an issue for us than say somebody, you know, 20 miles down the road in, I don't know, Fort Erie or, or north of us? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Butters, I, I can't comment on other municipalities. I've done a, a review myself as well. Okay. And I can provide that information to Council, but when you look at the accessory law coverage, from what we had at 3%, that was what we've had for 36 years. Mm -hmm. Now we're increasing it, proposing to increase it to 5%. Other municipalities, you will go from 25 to 5%. Township of Wainfleet, for example. Other municipalities do it differently based on overall law coverage in relation to accessory law coverage. Uh, I hate to comment on a neighboring municipality, but one of their accessory law coverages did not make sense to myself. You cannot have an accessory law coverage that's the same as your overall law coverage. Because mm -hmm. you need to have your principal structure on your property. That, that's the main use of your lot. So one, one actually relates to the other in a big way? It certainly does. Okay, so my, my next question is, so somebody buys a piece of property and, I'm, and, and it's determined that they have the room to put on that piece of property a house that's 1,700 square feet. And they decide not to put that big of a house on. They only put a house at 600 square feet. Does that mean that they can use the other, other 1,100 square feet for accessory purpose? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Butters. That's incorrect, no. Because okay. you have the overall, your maximum lot covers includes all accessory structures and your principal structure. So the relation between accessory to principal it should be a difference because accessory is not your main use. That's why you have your overall lot coverage is a lot higher than your accessory. Accessory is there for an accessory use. Just because you have a small house on your property should not give you the permission to have a huge <coughs> detached garage, no, not for even example. To have a huge one. Just would you be able to use some of that leftover room to be able to, to build something bigger than 5% say? That's, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting in any way that you should have a huge big garage and a ninky dinky house. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying if you chose to build a smaller house and that is set at 5% now, you know, you haven't used up all the allowable room on your principal thing, could you, or are you, are you going to be stuck with that 5% number? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Butters, you have, you have two, two lot coverage calculations, your accessory lot coverage and then your overall lot coverage. When you have your overall lot coverage, that includes your accessory and your and principal. House. So if an individual decides to build a smaller house and a bigger garage, you cannot exceed your overall lot coverage. However, just because you have a smaller house does not then give you extra room to build something above your accessory lot coverage. Okay to get back to the overall maximum coverage. Okay. Okay, thank you. You've answered my questions. Thanks. Any other questions on item number one? Mr. Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Dan. Dan, because I see Earl and Shelley in, in the audience here, and they put a request in uh, um, on page 37. Um, has that request been satisfied? For what to Mr. Asked? Mayor, to Councillor yes. Bonner, yes, I believe it has. Okay, and I'll look for, yeah, okay. They're waving, yes, okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other questions of Mr. Aquilina? At this time, the recommendation has been moved and seconded, and there has been an amendment that was, has been passed. Um, we will, uh, subject to comments from our CAO, we'll move to pass the report and we'll deal with the proposed zoning bylaw in the next cycle at the next meeting of council. Is that correct? Right. We're happy? Okay, so we're moving recommendation of the report. 
Councilor Bonner. Just one comment. I think we should acknowledge the work that staff put into this. We didn't farm this out to a consultant. Our staff did this, and from it looks pretty good to me. And and you know, I've been assured by staff they've been over it and over it. So kudos to them. I think they. I don't know what the dollar figure was that they saved us, but it was it was considerable. So thanks, Mr. Aquilino. Any idea if it's been referred out to formal consultants? What this would have cost the municipality, Mr. Mayor? This could cost anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. <coughs> Easy. Which we've saved by you doing this in house. Yes, sir. Congratulations and thank you. Now, can we call for uh, a vote on the recommendation? But it's not understood. It's not the approval of the bylaw. And it was moved by Councillor Kenny and seconded by Councillor Main. Okay. All those in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Next item is item number eight. I believe that Councillor Dimmery. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Region of Niagara Re Protocol for Planning Services between Niagara uh, Regional Municipality of Niagara and Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, PDS Report 2-2018. Is there a seconder for that recommendation? Councillor Kenny? Okay. Discussion? Yes. Councillor Demmer? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, again. Um, I just I have some questions on it, is, is all. Um, one, there's a... If you look on page 93, there's a working group referenced. Um, and I just wanted to know who um, who is on that working group, um, what form those consultations took, um, and what, if any, representation did Port Colburn have uh, on this group? Mr. Demery, can, or Mr. Demery, Mr. Echolina, can you Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to, to Councillor Demery. The working group that is referred to here is a subgroup of the area planners, and that is planning directors and just, you know, supervisors, you know, they're not directors, they could be managers, that took place, and they meet periodically. It's not only to review the memorandum of understanding, but talking about different functions that happen regionally that other municipalities can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. So they had those discussions. I was not able to attend, okay. unfortunately. But I can say that, you know, th they're very thorough. Yep. And some of the changes that are, they're looking to put in place have to do with the fact that the Conservation Authority does not or decided to no longer provide the service that they were doing on behalf of the region of Niagara. So because of the memorandum of understanding that all the municipalities have entered into, they need to make the changes because the Conservation Authority is as well as part of that memorandum of understanding. So that's what the report is saying, that the changes that they're making are all going to be implemented and they actually refine some other issues. For example, the species at risk. Yes. There was some ambiguity as to who was responsible and so the memorandum of understanding will now take care of that so it's clear. So okay. to say that you know this agreement is necessary, it is. Yeah. I'm in full support of that, and I think council <laughs> should acknowledge the fact that this report strengthens what the conservation authority's role is and what the region of Niagara's role is as well. Yeah. And, and just to, to make a point on that, I, I don't. I'm not in disagreement with the motion itself, but I just I needed some more information about it. Were you, were you actually uh, invited to attend? Was an invitation ex extended to uh, anyone from Port Colborne? Through Mr. Mayor, yes, I get okay. the invitations monthly. Okay, that's, that's Just, yeah, I wanted yeah. to make sure of that. Um, and now the, the, there were comments made, and obviously these comments formed the basis of, the, of this motion. Will those comments be made available to us here in Port Colborne? Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Demery, the comments that were made on, beha on the protocol. area planners to that form this memorandum of understanding, those specific comments? Yeah, it says the, air, the, area, uh, the area planners and Niagara Home Builders Association have been informed and consulted on the process and have had opportunity to comment on the protocol. That's what I want to know. Those comments, will they be made available to us? Through Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Demaray, 
I will get those and I can provide those to council. Great, that's that's good. Thank you. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, and, and for the purposes of reviewing the document that's before us here, um, the inclusion of the financial considerations would have been helpful, and it's not there. So possibly you could you could uh, find those as well and uh, and uh, see where that sits. And this that's actually more a regional responsibility, I would think, uh, because that's. Uh, um, expected financial costs resulting from the region assuming the responsibility for the review of the national environment matters environmental matters have been accommodated within the council uh, within the council approved 2018 operating budget so if we could get that from, that piece from the region I would appreciate that as well and that's that's just all it was really uh, I was questioning things rather than making a comment on the motion in itself any other questions on the recommendation there being none Call the question. All those who are in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Next item is item number 12. Mrs. Demery, I think that was you too. Dealing with health care services in uh, the Niagara region. City of Resolution, uh, sorry, City of St. Catharines Re, Town of Fort Erie, support of resolution, health care services in Niagara Region. That's uh, the motion. Is there a second or further recommendation? Councilor Main, discussion. Okay. Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to get to my point of question. Hmm. My iPad is not cooperating, but basically, um, my notes have just disappeared. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Look, I know I have that. I just my, my notes that I wrote on the uh, on the motion have just disappeared. Okay, so I can pretty much put, piece them together though. Okay. Now, in our meeting on December eleventh, uh, twenty seventeen. Uh, we referred the resolution to the Port Colborne Medical Education, Recruitment and Health Services Committee for review and recommendation to the council. Basically, what I wanted to know is what, what did they have to say? What has come out of that? Mr. Louis. Through your worship to Councillor Demery, we've only had one meeting of the Medical Services Committee or Health Services Committee since this was passed. That was in January and this item was not on the agenda. I do expect to get it on the agenda for the March meeting and uh, get some comments back to council. Sorry, I can't make eye contact with you. Um, get some uh, comment back to council subsequent to that March meeting, hopefully the second meeting in March, which is March 26th. Okay, so this will come back to us yes. at that forum. That'd be good. Because I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing their, their, uh, their comments. Yes. Thank you. That's all it was. Thank you. Call for a vote on the recommendation. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next item is item number 19, uh, Councillor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this one um, is Catherine McGarry, Minister, Ministry of Natural Resources um, and Forestry regarding response to the City of Port Coburn's resolution regarding the appointment of a provincial supervisor to the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. Is there a seconder for the recommendation? Councilor Elliott, discussion. Councilor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just bringing, uh, it was a very nicely written letter. Um, however, it uh, pretty much ignored uh, what, what we asked for. And, it, and that's not surprising to me either, but that's okay. Um, if I go find this, this letter, I'm just skimming through here. Uh, but what she does suggest is that, um, you know, because it's kind of through the region that we, in a nutshell, that we, uh, we work with them and, and get our points across to them. So um, I, I think the way to proceed, because they're, they're not going to obviously do the supervisor thing, 
Um, the second part of that motion dealt with the dissolution of the board. So what I would like to do with the council's support, I guess, and blessing is when the new clerk comes on board, Amber, um, a couple weeks into her um, being with us, I would like to have the chance, and maybe maybe one of the other two of the other counselors would like to join me, is have a have a meeting with her and and um, and look at the best way to proceed and the proper way to proceed in um, asking the region for uh, that second part of our motion to be um, upheld, which is uh, looking for a skills based board you know instead of the way it is now that's uh quite political so um that's my intent and once i've worked with our new clerk and whoever whatever other <laughs> counselor wants to get in on board with me on this uh bring forward a, a another resolution or another way to move this just continue to move this forward as um as the last one indicated so I am I'm a little confused. Are you moving and seconding this resolution, or are you deferring it? To, no, you have well, an I mean we're going to accept speak this. New clerk. This accept, we're going to accept this as their response to us, obviously. But my suggestion is just that once we have the new clerk, on, you know, with us for a little while, then well, the next step because of our resolution of November, in late November, um, it's it's not going to be carried through the province. So therefore, we need to carry it through with the region. Um, the next, the rest of the way forward. Okay, and do we have a seconder for that recommendation um, again? Yeah. Councilor Kenny? Any further discussion? Be no further discussion, call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. That would appear to have concluded all our items for consideration. Are there any notices? Are there any notices of motion? There'd be none. I'd call for a motion motion of adjournment. Moved by Councillor Doucette, seconded by Councillor Bonder. All those in favor? Carried. Meeting is adjourned. And then we'll move on to the next meeting. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of Council 03-18 on Monday, February 12th, 2018, following our committee of the whole meeting. Are there any addendum items, Madam Clerk? We'll just wait. Any addendum items? No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. I'd entertain a motion to confirm the agenda. Moved by Councilor Bodner, seconded by Councilor Doucette. All those in favor? Carried. Are there any disclosures of interest on the new agenda? There being none, it shall be so recorded. I call for a motion to adopt a minute, special meeting of council 01-18, held on January 22nd, 2018, and the regular meeting of council 0218, held on January 22nd, 2018. I've seen a motion to adopt those minutes, moved by Councillor Elliott. <coughs> Second by Councillor Kenny. Call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Are there any items requiring separate discussion? There being none, it shall be so no noted. And then I call for a motion to approve those items not requiring separate discussion. Moved by Councillor Bodner. Second by Councillor Butters. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Other proclamations? Doctor with a heart. Madam Clerk, do you have that proclamation available? I'm just going to move in a second. Moved by Councillor Main. A proclamation on doctors <coughs> with a with heart, seconder. Councilor Kenny, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. There are minutes of board meetings, uh, commissions and committees. Uh, 10A, minutes of the Port Program Active Transportation Advisory Committee of November 20th, 2017. And minutes of the Port Corporate Transit Advisory Committee 
Meeting of October 18, 2017. I entertain a motion to approve those minutes in bulk. Moved by Councillor Bodner, seconded by Councillor Main. Any discussion? There being none, call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? They're carried. Consideration of bylaws. Madam Clerk, do you have the bylaws? The three bylaws on the agenda this evening. Bylaw 6550-05-18 being a bylaw to stop up and to close, declare surplus, and to authorize the sale of a portion of Victoria Street Road Allowance Plan 831, now Garlinda Street, between Sherwood Forest Land and Omer Avenue, being all of pin number 64137-0107LT to 2023781 Ontario, Inc., Bylaw number 6551 five, five, one, slash, uh, oh, we rolled the numbers because the one bylaw. Okay. Bylaw number 6551-06-18 being a bylaw to authorize entering into an agreement of purchase and sale with Andrew Sovey or assignees respecting 14 King Street, Valley Camp. And bylaw number 6552-07-18 being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Colborne at its regular meeting <coughs> on February 12th, 2018. Can I vote mover and a seconder for those bylaws? Moved by Councillor Butter, second by Councillor Demery. All those in favor? Opposed? I am carried. Are there any further items? Other than that, I call for a motion of adjournment. Moved by Councillor Bonner, seconded by Councillor Doucet. <laughs> Frank's not here. Someone had to do All those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? It's carried. The meeting is adjourned. With it.